We're going to talk about buy online, and right now we're calling it BOPIS, but it's buy online pickup at unit, basically, is what it amounts to. In the beginning here, we're going to kind of blend retail in with it. But kind of one of the things I noticed about yesterday was you are, we need to get to the point where we're much more customer focused than we have been before, both on the restaurant side and the retail side, but in specific, the restaurant side. Much more focused on customer than we are on operations. I sat in a breakout yesterday and basically I understand from listening to that the pain that's going on, but it's very analogous to what's happening at retail right now. How do we pay for this? We know where the customer's going, they're going over there. I have 600 units, how do I get there? So hopefully this is gonna help us a little bit today, but one of the things I think that we have to understand is we gotta keep up with that customer or somebody else definitely is going to. So we're gonna talk about BOPIS today, and again, we're gonna blend some numbers, but you'll see that this is a little bit more than just a trend that's happening to you or that your numbers are going up. I mean, check this one out, if it works, there it is. I mean, it's happening globally. So there's a 70% adoption rate across the globe. So people everywhere are understanding, and I heard it said in a couple of presentations yesterday, well, I'm gonna press a couple buttons, I'm really tired, I drive one hour each way to work, and so now all I have to do is like stop at this place because I'm pressing my button about halfway there, pick up the stuff, and go home. And that's happening, again, across the board, and not only that, but it's happening globally. So I guess the comforting part is we're not alone, and maybe Google has like a ton to do. Well, and the only thing I'd say about that, too, as far as uh, the BOPIS adoption rate, it's actually a lot less in the U.S. than it is in Europe. Uh, a lot of it's been driven by grocery in Europe. Uh, so we've got some catch-up to do as far as uh, keeping up with what the consumers are looking for. Then, if you break it down, come down the funnel a little bit. Over the past five years, takeout, period, for restaurants has increased over 20%. So one day you were 20 doing $100, and the next day you're doing $80. And this is going like this. And one of the numbers that I saw yesterday was that uh, in terms of like how hockey sticks work, they actually do work like hockey sticks. In terms of a graph, it goes like this, and then it starts to take off. And they circle this one part, I believe it was Meredith that did this, and said, we're taking off right now. We're just at takeoff point. So what we're going to talk about today, I think, is, is, is relevant and then a lot of decisions have to be made, like we're going to have to have a conversation with the CEO or the CFO. And then this is a study that, that WD Partners did alone. We talked to 4,000 consumers around the country, and we talked to them about 14 different technologies, digital retail technologies. So in other words, uh, like some of the things that Wendy's and McDonald's has done where you walk in and, and you press your order and you go sit at your table and they bring it to you, that was one of them. Uh, another one was like an endless aisle for a retailer. You don't have my size, you don't have my stuff, you're gonna get it for me right away. 14 different technologies. This was number one by far. So it was number one and the next one was like number five in comparison, maybe like 45, 50% compared to buy online, pick up and store. And this was done three years ago, so for a, kind of a long time now, customers have been saying, this is what I wanna do. I'm gonna buy from you with my telephone and then I want to just come and get it. I'm on my way home from work, or I got the kids in the car. Just put it in my trunk, and I want to go to the tune of 86%. And let's face it, if all you guys have done research, that's about everybody. So everybody is saying, this is what we want to do. So globally, I hope is everybody um, half asleep, or have I done that? <laughs> yeah, um, and this is a pretty retail-specific one, but we wanted to kind of point out that, well, Buy online pickup and store adoption has been booming. It, it varies by sector and it varies by format, right? So, uh, and I imagine within the restaurant world, it's going to be the same. There are going to be some uh, some uh, restaurant formats that are a better fit for it. But if you kind of look at it, it's, it's, it's kind of obvious, right? Like health and cosmetics is on the low end because if you're like my daughter, you know, I've watched when she buys makeup, she wants to touch it, feel it, rub it on her hands, and all that kind of good stuff too. And then all the way at the other end, you've got electronics because I don't want to leave my you know, my large screen TV sitting out in front of my house waiting to get stolen, right? So there's a pretty good, uh, you know, understanding of why certain sectors might be more interested in BOPIS, but there's still opportunities regardless of which sector you're in. I mean, in the health and cosmetics area, 
It's true that you know, when you're making your initial purchase, you probably want to go and look at that product before you go ahead and buy it. However, and the idea of replenishables, right? And again, replenishables for food is probably not as common, but for in health and cosmetics, once I find that product that I really like, being able to set up a replenishable uh, buy online, pick up in store where I know when I'm close by, I get a notification, pick up that product again. Um, so while buy online, pick up in store uh, has different rates of adoption across various sectors, there's a good fit, you know, depending on which restaurant uh, sector you're, you might be in. And just another chart to show you, like <clears throat> where business has been in general compared to what's happening with BOPIS. And uh, I don't know, that doesn't look like a hockey stick, it looks a little more like a whip. Well, it's also missing dates, right? So this is over the past year, right? So what we've seen, and you know, when we talk about brick and click, we're talking about stores that offer you know, online sales and also, also offer in-store sales. So someone like Target, you know, you can do both. So when you look at the, you know, the growth that they're seeing uh, with brick and click online orders is up 21%. Buy online, pick up in stores about up 120 percent. So on the, the, this consumer uh, preference for this this method of purchasing is booming, and in particular in the past year, it's really been booming. And just to kind of wrap it up, even this past holiday, buy online, pick up in store was up almost 50 percent from the year before. So this this is something again with that hockey stick. I mean, it's really taken off. And I think next year it's probably going to be another 50% up from that. And just one other quick anecdote about how buy online, pick up in store can really you know, move the needle on the bottom line. Walmart moved from uh, the number three online retailer to the number two online retailer in Q4 of last year. Um, and very, very much on the basis of its growth in grocery. And that's being driven in large part by buy online, pick up in store. So. The, the, you know, Wall Street has, uh, has rewarded them for the, the growth in that area. So we're really seeing that not only are consumers interested in it, but Wall Street recognizes the, the growth that this can put on your bottom line. Are you uh, we'll do some at the end. How about that? I know Lee's going to shoot me for saying that. but <laughs> Oh, you want to go ahead? What? Take a question or ladder? Yeah, I'll take a question. Why not? I just wanted to clarify two slides ago. Yep. We'll find out if we're that savvy. I'm, Come I'm on, trying. Luke, we can do it. Yes. Can you clarify um, blue? Yeah, so the blue is typical brick and click. When I say that, I mean stores that not only sell online, but sell offline too, right? So it's not a pure play like Amazon, it doesn't have stores, although I guess they do, or, you know, or Wayfair. Someone like Target, someone like Walmart. So what we're seeing here is e commerce. For those brick and clicks folks like Target and Walmart and Dick's and all those guys are up 21%, right? At the same time though, we're seeing much larger growth in online orders that involve an in-store pickup. So the difference shipping? So the, so the que you know, question about why, why do people want to do it? That's correct. That's correct, right. And The absolute is very substantial. And, and, and again, I think that's why I wanted to throw out the reference point about Walmart, right? It was so substantial that it actually led from Walmart uh, overtaking Apple as a number three online retailer, right? So there are definitely, and go back and look at Target, right? Target's latest earning reports, look at Walmart's latest earning reports. They are real numbers, they are real substantial growth. And I think at the Super Bowl, if you all saw that awesome ad that had every licensed character known to man that drove a car, uh, Walmart is going big in that area, and you're not taking out Walmart ads in the Super Bowl with $4 billion worth of licensing unless you know it's an important, meaningful uh, mechanism. I think the other factor that comes into play, which is a slide that, that we took out really, was the fact that you don't, you don't pay shipping at all. So in other words, if you buy online, you have it shipped to your house, you're going to pay shipping. If you go buy online, pick up in store, you don't. That's another reason why this has really taken off. Hey, can I just throw one quick thing out that right there too? Like one of the things that's a key determinant of whether or not a buy online pick up in store experience is preferable to a user is there's two things. One is is how much is it going to cost me to ship, right? If I got to ship it, then I do that calculus in my brain, saying like, yeah, it's worth it. And then there's also how far am I from this location, right? So at the end of the day, the consumer is thinking, what resources do I need to expend to get this damn thing, 
right? In combination of time, combination of money. And what I think is interesting is for your guys' perspective, and I imagine those of you that have engaged with Uber Eats and some of those folks, as you've seen their model kind of evolve and there's more costs being passed on to the end user, it'll be interesting to see what happens as those costs get passed on to the end user. Because in the case of grocery, I think it's kind of being distorted with same day delivery because you got a venture capital funded Instacart that's out there doing this, but nobody else really is. The question is over the course of time, if consumers really have to pay eight, nine, ten dollars for delivery, is that gonna shift them back to a buy online, pick up in store? The research would indicate that it will. Because if you put that cost back on them, they're gonna be like, well, shoot, I'll just go drive over there. Right, so I think that's one thing that is applicable to you guys too, is that like, right now a lot of the cost of delivery is being hidden by a lot of tricks, like taking the, you know, paying the drivers out of tips and stuff like that. When all that stuff gets out of the way and the cost really gets reflected back to the, the shopper, we might see some shift in online behavior. I think that's why buy online, pick up, pick up it yourself is preferable. And I've done it myself a, a ton of times, like in between where I live and where I work is a target. So why not buy something, just pull up right to the Target, get it put in my trunk and go home. I don't have to make a special trip, I'm going home anyway and the store is in between that. And I think that is especially applies to food. Like what am I gonna make for dinner tonight? Well why don't I just do this and when I come up I'm telling them I'm coming at, at 6.15, so I'm gonna pull up, you put it in the trunk, I come home and I eat with all my kids. Okay, we're gonna talk about the opportunity now. And uh, this is like a couple of facts that, that we already know about, but. Uh, and I've known this personally for years. We worked with Wendy's and a number of other QSR companies, but almost 80%, 75 to 80% of the business goes around the back of the unit, back by the garbage, you know, back up against the brick wall where kids are throwing stuff against the brick wall, up to a window that looks like it's 80 years old. That's the brand experience that they have with QSR. And then for casual dining, like I was looking up the numbers the other day, and it's been rising just this last year, Takeout is rising 20% 10, over the course of the last three years and 10% just last year. So it's really hitting all restaurants across the board. I don't know what's happening in fine dining, but I'm sure it's happening there because I, for one, am doing that as well. At the same time, I mean, as I just described, like the worst brand experience you get, even if you're doing it at casual dining, we're, we're just trying to figure it out. And, I saw some things yesterday like, let's, let's put this rack up here with a bunch of bags with everybody's name on it. You pull up your car in a special space and you walk in there and you gotta go through all the bags and try to find your stuff or even the way Chipotle does it, you're sitting in the parking lot thinking, is this thing gonna be ready? And then you know, with QSR, like I said, you drive past the garbage, you go, that's what I think of when I think of a QSR is I drive past the garbage and take a look at that. So obviously there's a lot of improvement that needs to happen. Let me take that clicker for a sec, because I got my fancy animation here. Here you go. Nice. Um, we're casual. I just got fired. We're, we're, we're casual. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, this is the stat that I really love, um, and, and, and it shows some changes in consumer behavior. The, the, this is 600% growth in mobile searches for can I buy and near me, right? And it's, it, it, it's kind of a new behavior, right? When people are out in the road, the nature of their searches really changes. When they're, when they're shopping at home or they're online at home, they're probably more in like a research mode, right? Like maybe I'm checking out various things I might wanna do or buy, all that kind of stuff. When I'm in my car, when I'm out in the streets, I'm looking to take action, right? So the nature of the searches that we're seeing coming through Google are very action oriented. And the question is, how do we act on that? How do we take advantage of this, this customer that's exhibiting serious buying intent? I'm gonna use a retail example here, um, but I think you guys can see how it can apply. So in this, in this case, um, it's my brother's birthday, and I procrastinated until the last minute, so I've forgotten to get him something. It's his birthday that day, it's Sunday, party's that afternoon, and I'm scrambling to say, where can I buy a Yeti cooler near me? because I want to get him something, and I've waited too long. And this is actual live screen grab. And then you see the Yeti cooler near me comes up, and then there's all these stores that are then saying, not only do I have it, but I've got it in stock today. See that little in-store, how far away it is, all that kind of stuff. And as you can see, there's not a ton of screen real estate, right? So the user is saying, can I get this near me? And there's really only a couple spots up top that you want to surface, right? How do I capture that activity? So in this case, I click through, right? and I buy this Yeti cooler through REI, uh, and REI real quickly says, oh yeah, it's available in the store, 
It's near you. It's on the way up there, right? And by the way, that little shopping, shipping restrictions apply. When you click on it, it says that it's an oversized item. It's $75 for shipping, right? So for me as a shopper, I just said, hey, where can I get this thing near me? And two clicks away, before I went to Amazon, before I went to Dick's, before I went anywhere else, there was an opportunity for somebody to capture me and said, hey, I've got what you want, and I'm ready to fulfill what you want now. And I think the same types of, uh, we see the same types of searches take place in the restaurants as well. You know, like, where can I get a burger near me? You know, where can I get gluten-free food near me? All those kind of things. How do we surface that in a way that allows people to take action? And we've got some things that we're working on with Waze I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a bit. Uh, but we're really looking for ways to enable you guys to satisfy that shopping intent as quickly as possible uh, by servicing your restaurants when people are looking for that category of restaurant. So being timely, being there when the user is looking for that, uh, for that exact moment is a huge opportunity. There you go. Rehired. <laughs> Nothing better than an ex-employee working for you. Um, so all in all, I think we can do better. And I think that's the rest of the presentation. We're going to start to talk about things that, that we can do better, but not till we diss it just a little bit more, I think. Yeah. Um, so the first thing is, and this is kind of geeky. Gosh, that is one dirty phone that guy has there. Look at that. Um, the first thing is that a lot of the buy online, pick up a store solutions that we see in Market Today are very driven by the application, right? It's, it's all based on the app. And one of the challenges that we see a lot is that users just don't want another app. They have no interest in another app. Your app penetration rate's gonna be pretty low. So when we're, buy, when we're thinking about buy online, pick up and store solutions, we wanna think about ones that are not completely dependent on a proprietary app. I had a conversation with an exec not too long ago, and they'd, I showed him some incredible designs, which I'm gonna share with you today, and I said, well, that's great, but we can't get anybody to convert to our app. We have like a 10 or 12% conversion to app. Starbucks has the top in the industry, and they're at only 20, 25%, so what are you talking to me about? Because I'm, I'm not sure this app thing will work, and I think we're gonna get to a solution here in a minute. Yeah, and um, you know, there's, there's, the, the reasons are pretty obvious. You know, they, they, they delete apps because they don't buy from the provider enough. You know, maybe I downloaded that app because I wanted to check it out. And the, the other is the reclaim phone storage, right? And this is, this is actually becoming more of an issue because on the next slide, uh, the next slide. <laughs> I, was um, I was busy. <laughs> the, uh, we actually, with it at Google, and I know the iPhone has this too, but within Android, we actually now proactively tell you to de delete apps, right? Like, hey, you haven't used this app in a month. You want to delete it? Sure, right? So, like, it's harder than ever to get, you know, it, it's, hard, it's always been hard to get people to download your app. It's harder than ever to get them to keep the app, right? So, apps are awesome. They do a lot of great things, but we can't have our strategy dependent on them. Okay, so we know this to be true now, too. And even after being in this conference for a few days and I was looking at uh, off-premise innovation and what we've done, boy, we have a little door on the side of the restaurant. Man, we have a little sign up in the front where you can park in one of these spaces that are full. Or you can do this and you can do that. And I, I, don't, I wouldn't call it innovation. I'd call it necessity. Like, we've got to do something. Like, where are these guys going to park? Where are they going to go? I don't know. Maybe we knock a hole in the side of the restaurant. So here's some things. Like uh, this type of innovation. So for QSR, if, if you kind of look like right to left, I think I thought one of the most innovative things, I remember I was in an In-N-Out Burger, and a guy comes out, and he's got a little umbrella. I thought, wow, isn't that great? And then, the, you know, the digital retail integration is what I was talking about with that screen in the middle. Wow, we put up a screen and you can press things now. Isn't that great? So now we get to fire some poor, like, low, low wage person on the inside of the store. Or you can do it like McDonald's. I mean, one, I saw a McDonald's restaurant with three drive ins, like, you know, the old banks used to be with three drive ins. That's not really innovation, it's really necessity in terms of what's happening with the business. Yeah, this is one that I know is, is, a, is a pretty common issue, which is. You know, the user is used to the idea of, I place my order uh, in a drive through line and I get my confirmation board will tell me what I ordered back pretty quickly, right? There is kind of a disconnect that users have, which is, I placed my order on my phone like three miles away from the restaurant. Did they really get it? And is it right? And so, like, uh, 
I always ask when I go into a restaurant, I'll ask the staff you know, uh, behind the counter, hey, do you guys uh, get a lot of people coming up and asking if, they've got, if you've got their order? And they're like, oh yeah, all the time. People walk in, the first thing they say is that, like, hey, do you got an order for Chris? And they look and they go, yeah, we got it. And they come back and they go, is it two chicken sandwiches and a Coke? And they go, yeah. You know, so like just the idea of like, there is this anxiety that people have about like, do they have my order and is it correct? And it's the way that it's being done most commonly now is users asking, the staff member having to stop what they're doing, go check and then come back. So definitely not an efficient perspective. Uh, the next one is I'm not recognized, right? Like the idea of I have to, uh, you, know, who, you know, being able to prove who I am. I had a pretty funny experience at a Staples uh, with a buy online pick up and store experience. I ordered some printer ink and I walked in and uh, the gal had this really old phone and she was scrolling through it all like this. She goes, which one of these is you? And I was like, the one with the most expensive order, you know, but like the, uh, but like, but there was really, there, it, it was, it was, it was clunky and ugly. So, you know, think about a solution where I come in and like, I don't have to worry about how I'm proving it's me or whether or not they have my order. How do we make that all one seamless experience? I'm identified, my order is correct, all that good stuff. I think you take a little gas out of post, Postmates and, and people like that once you make this process much more seamless or much easier to do. If I can do it in two minutes when I'm on my way home from work, it makes a big difference between sitting on my couch and calling Postmates and getting charged $18 for it. So I think that ultimately this is sort of what happens. You start to go, well, I am going to call Postmates because I know the last time I went there and I did that, I had to sit down in a restaurant. They asked me if I wanted a drink in 15 minutes 16 minutes later, you know, I might as well have just stayed at the restaurant altogether. So it's like, well, you know, it's not worth it. I don't think. And I'm I will say, like in retail, it's like the experiences are way worse. Right, the retail experiences are atrocious. I mean, I think restaurants have done a much better job because they've been used to the idea of people coming into the store, picking up stuff, and all that kind of stuff. But like, the retailers are the experiences are terrible, and they're not going to get a second chance at it. Yeah, I'll second that. I had, I had an experience with a retailer where. I ordered something online, I went online, they had it, and I said, okay, great, I'll pick it up at whatever. I had to go park in the parking lot, walk inside the store, which I didn't want to do in the first place. I got in there, I waited in the line with a bunch of people that were just, you know, complaining about the merchandise they bought before. When I got up there, they go, we don't have your size. Head home. So improving the shopping experience. I think you might want to take this. I think that. that's yours. Okay, I'll take it back. I'll take it. So technology is good, which is Google's motto. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about, like one of the challenges that we're, we mentioned earlier was the idea that folks don't download the app, right? And then they delete the app afterwards. So the alternative to that is what can we do with, a, with what's on the phone already, right? How can we create an experience that addresses the 99% of people that have a phone instead of the 4% of people that have my app? And so. The consumers actually expect that they should be able to do everything on a, on a website, on a mobile website they do on an app. And the truth is, you actually can for the most part. There's very few things that you can't do through a browser that you can do through an app. Um, and the other, the other angle of it too is that like, even if you do go to a web-based model, you got to make it a seamless, painless process. And by that, I mean... I tried using uh, the web version of a major QSR's website to do ordering, and the, all the functionality was there, the ability to place an order and all that great stuff. But the challenge was, was that I had to fill out a, a new account form, and like, I can barely see, right? Uh, so like, when I'm doing this, it's painful. I gotta fill out first name, last name, email address, email address confirm, password, password confirm, and then, I had to enter in all my credit card information, right, on my phone. So the bottom line is, like, if you buy this, this number, then, like, you're losing people left and right, right? So, like, even if you have a great app, a great online experience, great web-based experience, you got to make it less painful for people to do this, right? And one of the ways you can do this really simply is by logging in with more popular platforms, right? Most likely, almost all of your customers that would be doing an order-ahead experience has an account with one of these jokers, right? And what we've got at Google is this really wonderful little solution called Firebase, which is you integrate with your backend system once, and then users can log in with all of these things, right? So if they got a LinkedIn account, and if that's, it's all about minimizing the barrier to them being able to create a new account on your site as quickly as possible, 
And this is a really inexpensive way to go about doing that. Um, the other thing is, I'm using REI as an example here, there's, but there's obviously huge restaurant applications. I wouldn't have to fill out my credit card information if I was able to use Google Pay or Apple Pay, which almost everybody who has a phone has, right? So being able to minimize the, minimize the need to fill out additional credit card information, they've already got this stuff on their phone with Apple Pay or Google Pay, all right? And the other thing you see there I mentioned is uh, the ability to have a loyalty program, right? So one of the things that we talked about earlier was the ability to identify yourself. With both Google Pay and Apple Pay, you have the ability to convey identity, right? So if I'm a Subway member, right, I can come in and I can associate that with my Google Pay or my Apple Pay account, and then when I come in to pick up my order, I just tap. Oh, Chris is here for a sandwich, right? There's no guesswork, there's no ancient phone they're pulling through to see which one is you. I walk in, I tap with my phone, an Apple phone or an Android phone, and they know who I am and they can, they can go ahead and fulfill my order. Um, the next is, this is again native capability uh, for anybody that has either Android or Google Maps. This is a new thing we're rolling out called rich business messaging. And you know, uh, you know when you're on an iPhone and you're, you're texting with somebody, you can see them actually typing on the other side. You know, so it's kind of like ongoing communication between them. We're rolling that out in Android too, big deal. What's actually the bigger deal though is that when you type in, you know, uh, say, you know, Boba Guys or Subway, whatever, in my phone, and it comes up with those listings, and you guys are used to seeing those, where it'll say directions, phone number, all that kind of stuff. We're going to have a new box that's going to be on there. It's going to be rolling out this year that says Message. And anybody who has an Android phone or anybody who has Google Maps on an iOS phone, right, is going to be able to then just click on that and start communicating with that restaurant, right? So if, the, if, if the, so if the staff in the back has, you know, whatever you're looking at with your Uber Eats, all that, whatever your, the technology is, maybe it goes to the store manager, but they can click there and they can start chatting with the store directly about questions they might have. The other thing they can do is they can also, um, we can have a bot on the other side. So if there's really common questions, it can go to the bot first to answer, hey, you guys open? Yeah, we're open, right? Like that kind of thing. Um, and then roll over to somebody when it has a question that's more specific. The other thing that's really cool about uh, rich business messaging too is that when I'm in the drive through line or anywhere and I want to add something to my order, I can actually have a preloaded transaction be sent through that interface, right? So if I'm talking, say, say I'm talking to uh, the staff member and I've already had my buy online pick up and store order, I'm here to pick it up and, and, and they say, hey, do you want to add like a frozen lemonade to that? Yeah, sure, boom, it just shows up in your phone, I click yes and I'm done, right? And that'll work in a drive-thru, that'll work in the store. And again, we need to figure out the right mechanisms for making this all work. We're just trying to reduce friction. And the point is, like, this is not functionality you would need to build into your app, it's, at, it's functionality that's, that's just available to anybody with Maps or uh, Android. Um, and then we, we can do all kinds of things also with messaging once they walk into the store. If we wanted to message them with something, let them know we've got your order. And the other way that we can send messaging to them also is to have a QR code for the pickup instead of an NFC tap, right? Hey, Chris, you walked in. We see you're here. Here's a QR code for your order. I walk in, I hit the QR code, and I'm good. And so this is, this is another one that is really compelling too, uh, is order assist by Waze, right? And what this is going to allow you to do is I place my order either through the website, through the app, and eventually through Waze itself. We're going to give the opportunity for users to actually order through Waze. But then at that point, I can share my location along the way with the restaurant. Right? Why is that important? Because what we're doing is we're making the shopper part of the logistics chain. Right? So when we're working with Uber Eats or any of those guys. We see where they're coming. We see the guys coming in. We see they're leaving and all that good stuff. Same way with the shopper. Right? So if you want to make certain that your fries are hot, share your data with us so we know that you're on your way and you're getting close. Right? And when, when Lee was kind of you know, busting the chops at McDonald's for having multiple drive through lanes, think about if you actually know 50% of your orders are ordered in advance, you know where everybody is, and then dynamically you can make those lanes all order ahead if that's all the orders that are coming in one order ahead because you know you've got one, a couple on the way, or if you've got no orders on the way, you know that you have no orders on the way, then it's all you know, drive through, take an order. So it's being more intelligent about that, and it starts with knowing where the shopper is, right? Where, they, uh, where the consumer is. 
So everything, everything that you just said, I think you got the first few. The, uh, everything that you just had to say gets us to this point. So we're gonna show you some visual solutions. And again, we're trying to stay ahead of the customer, less operations oriented, and try to think ahead of the customer, and then figure out what that solution is and how much it costs once you know that it's the right one. But with everything that Chris just talked about, all of what you're about to see, I think, is entirely possible. Yeah. And it's all about really having a, a seamless experience both for the consumer and then what's going on in the back of the house. So from the consumer perspective, you know, they're at their, they're at their website and they're ordering. You know, they, we know what they've ordered before, so they can go ahead and order really quickly, cut down the, the streamline on that. Um, you know, and again, this is what you've ordered in the past, one-click reorder. And then this is where the, the shopping, you know, sharing your location really comes into play because, sure, I can use ways to go ahead and tell me how far away it is and the ETA and how long it's going to take you to get there and all that good stuff. But at the same time, that information is being surfaced in the back of the house now, right? Just like we have with Uber Eats and all that good stuff where we can see that they're coming and where they are and all that good stuff. We're going to do that with consumers as well. Yeah. So I think when it, when it comes to the back of the house, this is a great shot where now back of house, including maybe the help with a company like Profitality, you're going you're gonna to start to see how all this stuff comes together. So I know exactly, like if, if Mary's going to be here in 15 minutes, I don't need to put that order in right now. I need to get that order going in about five minutes. So you start to work up a queue according to the information that we have and the location of the people that are coming to the, to the shop. And again, it could be on a board for everybody to see. So somebody who's working on the fryer unit, and somebody who's working on the burger unit, somebody who's working on vegetables, whatever it might be, somebody who's slicing the steak, knows how much time that they have before the customer arrives in the front of the shop. And I, I know for, for those of you that have worked with Uber Eats or Postmates and all that good stuff, like, I know that like, the more of those guys you work with, they all have their own little tablet they want to put on the back of your counter. Uh, we've actually got a great partner called Bring, uh, that some of you guys might have worked with uh, uh, at some point or another, but they actually bring all that stuff together into one screen, right? So you can have one screen that's showing all your various delivery options, including the shopper, so you're not dedicating half of your back of your house to 17 redundant screens. And then for the user, right? That, and we all know how the success of Domino's has had with that giving this constant feedback along the way. You know, we're, we're keeping everybody in line with doing it. We're keeping the back of the house of the restaurant online. We're also keeping the shopper engaged. And then you're arriving. Bingo. Mary's here. So this is why we have this shot up. You know, it's, a, it's our money shot. Uh, basically, one of the things about QSR, this is QSR in particular, so I apologize to casual diners at the moment, but we're going to show you a solution as well. But the, the thing that's always bothered me about QSR is that, again, 80% of the people get like a lousy brand experience because they drive through the, that part of the restaurant. So we've always worked on the front of the restaurant. How do you make the, the front of the restaurant better? Well, what if we took the restaurant all together and turned it around and started to celebrate the idea that 80% of your customers just want to pull in, they want to get that hot food, and they want to go. So the way that this, one, this thing is set up, now it's behind me and it's over there too, is three lanes. So the right lane is the speed lane. So now we know Mary's here. Mary's order is sitting on a heated counter there with Mary's name in a circle around it. The concierge goes, here comes Mary. Walks over to Mary, gives it to her as she goes. If you just decide, oh, well, I'm, I'm driving past that unit, I wanna get something, so I pull in. You're in the slow lane, which is off to the left. And once you're off to the left, you punch in your order on your phone. Now I'm the concierge, I know when that comes up and I can bring that over to you. That could be a little bit slower. But in either case, the traffic can pull out into the center and leave. So here's more casual dining. So why not take the side of the store and make it more, like again, celebrate the fact that your customer, this is the way that your customer shops and the way that customers really globally are moving. They want to pull up, they want to get something. So why do we have a little door there with a sign on it? Or why do we have this little thing? And why do we have some shelves on the inside of the place? Why do we make them get out of the car at all? Why not have them pull up, have a concierge right there, 
again, with everything that I just talked about and with everything that Chris just talked about, you know that they're coming, you know that they're there, the back room did too, the food is still hot, put it in their hands, off they go. And just in case you wondered, I mean, WD Partners has been doing restaurants for over 50 years, so we didn't just make this up. We took a look at the site specifically, and believe me, I got grilled by our CEO, like that's not gonna work. And so we had to bring in all the engineers and all the architects and go, this is a QSR or a casual dining site. Here's how the three lanes would work. Here's what we would do with the restaurant. Here's what we would do with the kitchen. Kitchen in the middle, you might notice. And then pick up on the front part of the store. It all works. It can be done. And so, you know, the converse side of that, for the 20% of the people, it's an 80-20 theory, You've got 20% of your customers who like to go to the store, 20, 25% of the customers, they like to go, they like to sit down, they need to get something to eat, they're on lunch break. They have 20, 25 minutes. Now they don't have to look at either cars in a row or cut through them to get to the place or look at maybe some super busy street, which is not really exciting. You can do something to the back. You can put greenery back there. Uh, you know, if I'm in the right neighborhood, I'm looking at some terrific housing. If I'm in the wrong neighborhood, maybe not. But there's something that you can do back there. And there's also, we haven't got into it yet, but there's probably some kind of entertainment or some kind of show or something that you might be able to show them as well. But again, the idea is to take the restaurant, turn it around. And so here's just another shot of the restaurant. It can be like that. You can either put the kitchen into the picture by opening up that red checkered wall, or you can just leave it the way it is. And so you can have a nice quiet lunch in the back with no cars going around, no garbage bins, no anything. The other thing that we understand because we've been doing restaurants for a long time is, yeah, I could say to Wendy's, hey, Wendy's, this is a great idea. And uh, she can go, yeah, that's, that's terrific, but I have like 6,000 units. What am I going to do with the 6,000 units? Other than start to whittle away. And maybe if I really put in a good program, I could do 100 of them a year, two a week, which is a lot. So we came up with this. We started to take each different version. You can go to the next one. Huh? Yeah, he's getting ready to get fired, I think. But nobody laughs. He's like not fireable. Is that the thing? <laughs> Call your I'm more, bluff. I'm more fireable than you are. You can do lockers. You can do the, the one that we just showed you. You can do lockers. You can do a concierge where you, you park in certain spaces and a concierge comes out, which is something that's happening now. Only if you take a look at those maps, I mean, they're devoted a little bit more to like a whole side of the store to nothing but concierge. And again, if the outside is clearly marked, like some of the renderings we showed earlier, it's going to be a lot easier. Then there's pull-up, where it could be the lowest form of remodel, but you might take the drive-through or what, you already exi what is already existing and enhance that in a lot of different ways, not just a door on the side. And then to a total drive-up, which if you, if you click, sir, this is the locker version. This is, is something that I keep thinking about. It, it, and again, to the, the idea of moving ahead of the customer. This is the way the customer really wants to shop. Why not do pickup stores or a, a sub and a, um, hub and spoke? So you could have a complete full restaurant, you know, with sit down as big as you want it to be. And then you could have those little spokes all over the place where you just basically pull up, you get your food and go. So you need a kitchen. You need to celebrate the fact that you do pickup. Everybody knows that Mary's coming. Mary pulls up. You have a three-way driveway right there. You get it or you order it on the spot and you go and that's it. No restaurant whatsoever. And then kind of last but not least, that, that idea of you know, more technology in terms of identifying when cars are here, that last shot. So, summary. My summary part's really easy. Like, use native phone capabilities for your apps whenever possible and we'd love to work with you at Google to support that effort. And then, and then from a design and uh, architecture and construction perspective, I think we really need to start to rethink how we're, it was the message I got from the, the breakout yesterday. It's like, man, we gotta rethink how we're doing things because nothing is really working. Like we're getting bags stacking up at the counter. We're creating an area for pickup and, and there's bags and there's stuff all over. We don't even know where they are. Mary comes and was, wait a minute, Mary, because there's 40 bags here and I have to go find your bag. So the, the, the redesign of the restaurant from storage to pull up to how you cook in the back. I mean, every, everything really kind of needs to be thought, tested, and then thought out again. 
And again, like ultimately, uh, we do operations as well. I mean, you, you have to understand that operations, the, the way that it's working right now has to totally change. I think I saw a video yesterday where somebody had somebody in operations, that's all they did it was somebody at Starbucks. That's all they did was keep track of all the cups of coffee that were sitting there from people that bought it online and wanted to come and pick it up to make sure that people weren't taking the wrong cups of coffee. I think the same is true with just every aspect of operations. Yep. So that's, that's it. it. Yep. Thank you. All right.